Um, folks, so can you all hear me? Everybody see me? Yes. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, so uh, really let me lovely to be here. <laughs> thank you so much, Janice. Let me do an introduction. So Janice uh, is with us today. Janice is the author of the novel Seahorse, the best-selling novella Nine Chambered Heart, short story collection Boats on Land. She was awarded the Sahitya Academy Yuva Puruskar and the Crossbook Book uh, Book Award for fiction in 2013. Uh, art reviews, book reviews, fiction, poetry is all featured in a wide selection of magazines and newspapers. Uh, in 2014, she was a Charles Wallace Creative Writing Fellow at the University of Kent. And in 2019, writer in residence at the Toji Cultural Foundation in South Korea. So she now teaches creative writing and history of art at the Ashoka University, lives in Delhi, and, um, and also has a cat. So important detail. So um, welcome, Janice, and thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Jathan. And hello, everyone. It's really um, lovely to make your acquaintance, um, even if, even if um, over Zoom. Um, you know, I hope um, you'll have a lovely afternoon with us. Great. So, um, you know, um, <clears throat> I have a... I have a um, the the format that we follow is a standard format. I'll ask a few questions, then we'll open it up, and Great. people in the group will also have a lot of questions. So then we will take all those questions, and it will be a Q and A between you and them. But um, you know, it's always good to figure out where it all started. So how did you land up in writing? How did this whole thing begin for you, being a writer? Right, right. Okay. Um, I think I'm a writer because. I grew up um, in a community of storytellers. Okay. Um, I, I come from the Northeast, as you know, the Northeast sure. of India. And um, uh, I come from a community, the Khasis, that never really had a script. Okay. Um, so we were always oral storytellers. Um, in fact, the whole of the Northeast region mostly is deeply um, entrenched in oral storytelling traditions. Um, so I grew up listening to lots of stories. So even when I'm asked where, where did it all begin and how did you start writing, um, I find it impossible not to acknowledge um, this, that um, I grew up as a listener. And I think it's because of that that I started writing. Um, I think, um, you know, often I'm asked, <laughs> who are your earliest literary influences? And again, um, you know, my, my, my influences are people who never really wrote a book, some of whom didn't know how to read or write, okay. but told marvelous stories and we would gather in the kitchen at weddings at funerals around the fire on cold winter nights and we would tell stories and I grew up listening to stories and it's something that I hold very close even now or it's something that I've come to start holding very close um, now uh, especially uh, in a creative writing and teaching space right. um, because I often feel that you know when we talk about writing and when we think about you know how do we sort of write the perfect sentence and you know the most sort of flawless story we tend to forget that listening plays such a huge part um, you know in in our relationship with language um, in how it falls on the page how it sounds to the ear so right. yes I think, um, you know, I started as a listener and then because, of course, you know, we all go to school, we all have a very textual, um, a textually oriented education, we start writing. So I like to think of myself as a storyteller to begin with um, and as a writer, somewhat slightly following that. Okay, cool. And... Um... And you know you you pursue many different forms of writing. So your um, you've got a collection of short stories, two novels. You're also writing poetry. So how does that work? I mean, do you come across an idea and say, you know, this would make a great poem, or this would make a great novel, or how does that whole process work for you? Yeah. Knowing yeah. that you do so many things. 
I try. Um, and I think, um, you know, it is a tricky question, of course, you know, is this a short story? Is this a novel? Um, is it a novella? Um, you know, all of these sort of categories that we tend to think of when we think of limits in some ways, word limits in particular. Yeah. Um, but I think what helps me is asking the question um, or shifting or reframing the question slightly and asking myself um, in which um, in which way can this story be most effectively told? And then, you know, to tackle something like form. Okay. Um, so you honor the story uh, to begin with. You almost have a conversation with it in some ways, as strange as that may sound. Um, but you begin by asking, how would you like to emerge into the world? Um, in which okay. way? Um, how, you know, um, how effective would you be as a novel, as a short story? And I think as you keep writing, as you keep telling stories, there's a little bit of an instinct and a little bit of a almost guttural um, reaction that um, you, uh, you, you nourish, that you tend to, that then helps you, I think, um, you know, decide uh, perhaps with slightly less um, confusion than, than before, but it does take um, that kind of experiential learning. And I enjoy all of these forms and that's what makes it even more difficult mm -hmm. um, because then, you know, the world is yours. You can opt for anything. Um, but that's why I find it useful to go back to the story, to ask this idea, in which way would you be most effective? What will you be? <laughs> yes, what will you be <laughs> nice it's, lovely. it's a lovely way to think about it yeah okay so yes, um, we, sometimes sorry just to add to that we sometimes think that you know we are the ones with all of the agency when we tell stories but our stories have agency too and they wish to emerge into the world in a particular way and we have to honor that mm, that's so interesting Cool. Uh, so I've been spending a lot of time reading this particular book. This is, uh, I don't know if you guys can see it, Boats on Land. Uh, this is the a book for which Janice won the Crossword Book Award and also the Sahitya Academy Award, right? And uh, mm -hmm. um, and I really enjoyed it, not for any other reason, except I think it's, you know, it's really like an introduction to another world. For <laughs> me, where, I mean, I've traveled in the Northeast, I've driven around Arunachal and been to Assam and stuff like that, but um, but um, it, this particular part of the Northeast, which is the whole Meghalaya and the whole background, and also because you're not, it's all not here today. It's like spanning a two hundred odd year year yeah. era of yeah. of stories. So when I was reading the thing, some of the stories almost sounded like fables, almost like you know, like you were saying, they've been handed down, you know, orally for many generations. Um, and um, so are they completely from your imagination? Are they kind of a mix up where some of them are clearly, you know, like like the story set in the Loreto convent and, and things like that. So those are clearly co contemporary short stories from here and now. So how much of, you know, how did that whole thing work out and what inspired you to kind of, you know, choose? Yeah. So, so how, what was that? Uh, walk us through that kind of, you know, decision-making process. Okay, okay. Um, you know, I think that um, this, the books that we write, we carry with us all our lives in some ways um, because we begin to write them from the moment that we're born um, and everything that we do and all the experiences that we have all the places we visit and all the conversations that we engage with, they all prepare us to write the stories that we write at some point, someday, in the future, whenever mm -hmm. that might be. 
Um, and these particular stories in Boats on Land, I think I've carried with me all of my life. Um, you're so right. Um, so many of the um, of the short stories in the collection carry shadows and ghosts of other stories um, that I've heard that um, family or friends or neighbors have shared um, at some point, um, you know, over some evening. Um, and uh, they've stayed with me and they also in some ways belong collectively to all of us because they are known stories where I come from. And I think okay. all of us in some okay. ways are, um, you know, so familiar. I'm sorry, can you please mute yourself or everyone else except Janice? Thank you. Sorry, um, sorry, Janice, please go. No worries, no worries. So all of us, you know, probably come from, from communities, families, where we have shared stories, where we all connect with certain stories or we know certain stories, you know, even the unsavory ones. Um, so these are the stories that sort of belong to all of us. Um, and... Um, Oh, I'm so sorry. Just give me one moment. I have no idea sure. who that is. Sure, no problem. While we're waiting for uh, Janice, um, I just thought I should mention that there's a uh, couple of other books also which are uh, which are there. There's Sea Horse. There is Where the Light Shines. And um, so I I do have plans to read all of those books. But while we wait for this one, I've particularly enjoyed, and I would suggest that you should definitely pick it up and try and read it. Boats on Land. Yeah, it's actually like an immersion into uh, into Meghalaya and uh, contemporary Meghalaya. Uh, you know, you know that they've had some trouble there in the past couple of decades. You know, with the law enforcement. So, what is that about? What does it mean for the real life of somebody from that place? So, I just think the overall, uh, you know, the, the, if if the task of a story was to transport you into another world, and uh, and kind of expose a new world to you. I think the, this set really does that really well. So yeah, I've enjoyed that piece. Oh, cool. Anupam. Some exchanges happening there. We'll wait a few more minutes. Hopefully Janice will be back soon. I'm right here. So sorry oh, about great. that. Um, there's no one else at home at the moment, so I have to answer the door. No um, but I'm back and I'm with you. Um, and Perfect. as I was saying, um, yeah. these are stories um, that really belong to us as a community. And so we all carry them. Um, but um, they are also stories that really shaped my experience of growing up in Shillong, um, the way that I sort of experienced this, this world where the ordinary and the extraordinary seemed to exist very easily, coexist very easily with each other. Um, how, you know, um, my grandmoms, um, you know, the daily workers would come in and tell us stories about their, you know, people from the village who have been whisked away by water fairies or by mischievous spirits of the forest. And they would tell us these stories with an absolutely sort of straight face that this is what happened. And, and so it was all of these various kinds of reality that sort of just jostled for space and just coexisted. And I thought, how do I capture that kind of very um, multi-layered, reality I can't write realist stories because they don't <laughs> quite capture my experience of being in a place like Shillong being in a place like Meghalaya um, and so um, a lot of these stories are crafted around storytellers and folk tales and folklore um, and they make their way you know into um, the tales in some form or another they become my versions um, they become ways of exploring this very complicated, multi-layered um, reality uh, that I, I, I think, you know, we, we 
um, I grew up with, um, which of course is also complicated by the fact that it's also a very politically troubled area. Um, mm. And so, you know, what is more fantastical? You know, mm. tales of people, you know, um, um, maiming each other and, and, and um, you know, and killing each other or folk tales. I, I, I sometimes struggled to tell what was more fantastical, sadly, right? Yeah. Um, so this was the attempt to capture that kind of rich, complex reality. Yeah. And in and your thoughts, sorry. And that, uh, no, just to add, that's why they kind of span that timeline as well. Right. Right. They're almost sociological in some ways in mm. nature, mm. Um, looking at a land and its people. Yeah. And in your stories, you often allude to the troubles, although you never really kind of get too graphic about, you know, what's going on, but it's always there in the background in a lot of the stories. And yes. yeah. Uh, yeah, the next question I had was about your point of view, because, you know, there is a mix of point of views, at least in Boats and Land. There's a few that are first person, there are a few that are third. And I was wondering if that was a obvious choice for you, or did you kind of struggle and did you write it in a voice and then go back and say, you know what, let me give it in a, a different mm. point of view. Mm -hmm. So how did that whole thing work for you? Because it's very interesting how you've done that in different places, yeah. Okay, I have no idea why there are so many people coming to the door. Just give me one moment. <laughs> okay, no problem. I guess we're going to have to wait. But to give you a, an idea of the book, so, uh, you know, there's a, there's a story right in the beginning. The opening story is called A Waterfall of Horses. And it's set in, I'd say, about 1890, maybe 1900 in uh, in Meghalaya in, uh, and it's um, about this the four British people and how they're um, you know there's different different British people who are staying there some are good people some are not so great and then it culminates in this uh, in this bunch of horses jo jumping over the waterfall sorry I'm just paraphrasing one of the stories and That's okay. uh, but it's told from the point of view of one of the young boys who serves these British people so that was one example where it's a where it's a very interesting perspective. Instead of telling it in the third person, you're actually telling it from the eyes of a small boy. So yeah. yeah. So go ahead now. Yeah, I think generally when we are talking about point of view, perspective, and how we might want to try and choose the most appropriate point of view. Again, there's no right or wrong here. Yeah. Right. There are only more or less effective ways of making certain decisions on the page that can aid you in what you're trying to do. Right. Um, so when it comes to perspective, I think there's a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, at least this is what I feel and what I use. Um, one is to think about what you're trying to do with your story. And really, all your craft uh, decisions, whether it's point of view, whether it's setting, whether it's dialogue, whether it's, um, you know, character itself, all of these must in some way feed into that core, that center of your story. Um, I find it useful to imagine a stone dropping into a pond. Yeah, and the point at which the stone touches the water, that is the heart of your story. And the ripples that are created around that uh, point of contact are all of the decisions that you make in relation to that center, to that core. Um, because they need to serve that center, that core mm -hmm. in some way, right? So your point of view your decision um, of whose point of view would it be, should it be, needs to be answered in relation to this. What are you trying to do with your story, right? Um, and then you, you know, look at your choices and you make the most effective choice in relation to that question. So the first story in Boats on Land, for example, 
um, is told from the point of view of a little local boy um, um, who, yes, who, you know, who he and his mom work in the British camp and he serves tea and all of that. And he is a very um, useful point of view because he's not British. He's not um, of the village. But he's somewhere in between. He is local, but he works for the British. Mm. And that gives him, and this is the second thing that I think you need to keep in mind when it comes to a uh, point of view. Um, he has access to certain kinds of information from both sides, not just the locals, but also the British. And that's a really important question to ask yourself when you're trying to decide who should you give your point of view to in your story? Right. What kind of access of information do you need your character to have? Mm. Nice. Right? Yeah. Um, and that I think will help you make those decisions on the page that then turn your story into you know, its most effective Mm. That reminds me a little bit of Great Gatsby because even in Great Gatsby, the narrator has got this very convenient vantage point and he's exactly. not even central to the story, kind exactly. of like your boy. Exactly. They often yeah. serve as the most useful vantage points. That's a really yeah. good term to use. Sometimes yeah. you don't want the central character in your story to be your narrator. Yeah. yeah. Because they cool. will have perhaps you know, less of a, 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 a less access to information sometimes about themselves. Mm. Because often our characters are not very self-aware. Right. They're not able to reflect on their own actions, mm. much like uh, in our own lives. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> it's yeah, it's sure. life. That's what we do. We're very blind sometimes to the decisions that we make and why we make them. So it's useful to have that kind of off-center character mm. telling the story because you are able to make those observations that the main character would mm. not, mm. right? So in, in the same story, uh, the narrator is a village boy, but when I was reading it, I felt like the language was kind of elite. You know, it was, it was quite rich and mm. uh, not the kind of language that a child like that might actually speak. But clearly you were comfortable with it. And, you know, many writers might have stuck with that level of the character in terms of vocabulary. But then mm -hmm. that's also a trade-off. So you're, you know, you lose something if you if you were to do that. Yeah. So think about I mean, that consciously. Is... So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, I didn't get your question. I jumped I was into just... uh, considering. So let me hear you out first. So I was just saying, was that conscious? Was that, you know, now that mm -hmm. you reflect on it, were you, are you comfortable with that or... Um, I think it's in my head at least, and I don't know, maybe this didn't quite come out in the story, but it is the narrator telling us the story about what happened in the past. Right. So it's a narrator who is speaking to us from a moment, you know, beyond the setting of that story. He is okay. possibly adult, um, you know, has sort of moved away, as we know from the end of the story, moved away from that place mm. um, and is looking back and telling us the story, um, you know, uh, about when he was a, a young boy. So that's sort of how it was um, in my head, that okay. he has the, the urgency and the immediacy of... Um, you know, being young and um, vulnerable in that space, but also has the added, um, you know, advantage of perspective because mm. he's growing older. Oh, okay, okay, mm. makes sense. So it's a it's a first person, but it's looking back at his childhood. So that's what's giving him the yeah. freedom. Cool. Yeah. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about was uh, research. So. Um, you know, in um, uh, when I'm looking at some of the stories, like in, in the 19 slash 87, you write of kite flying with such deep passion and understanding, right? In uh, Secret Corridors, you talk about a British major general being in Shillong during World War II, uh, especially the kite flying thing. I mean, you know, maybe it's a stereotype, but people associate kite flying 
So was that something you actually did? Was that something you already knew? Or did you I research no to no idea more? how to feel? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I clearly know in theory, but definitely not experientially. But, you know, as Jerry Pinto will say, and he's, you know, he's, he's here in April. So I feel very comfortable quoting him. Um, he will say that, you know, life is research. Conversation is research. Mm. Um, you know, he will say, sit on a bus and start speaking to the person next to you. And that is research. Right. Um, you travel on a train and you get to know, you know, the person who's sharing your birth, you share food, you share stories. And that is research. And to be very honest, the research for boats on land is very, very different to the research that we had to do for something like everything the light touches, you know, the the, the novel. Um, the research for boats on land is very much life driven, mm. conversation driven. I asked my father, I asked my uncles, how did you all fly kites when you all were young? Okay. Um, you know, and then they told me about um, this uh, trick of dipping the string of the kite in glue and then dipping that into shards Broken of glass yeah. so that you could, yes, yeah, so that you could cut somebody else's kite mid-flight and you know emerge victorious in this you know uh sky war uh, <laughs> that you're engaging with un uh you know nameless and unknown warriors kite warriors so really it's details like these that um you know that i gathered from you know from people around you you so you you talk to people you read of course sure. wherever that might be helpful um but so much of it is actually just asking people um for these little details yeah mm -hmm. but of course the research in everything the research for everything the light touches was very uh, very much based, you know, in libraries and reading rooms and uh, a lot of textual um, sources, which is a very different kind of research. It's, sure. you know, I did both for the book, but very, very much oriented to reading, you know, textual sources. Yeah. Cool. Interesting. Yeah, because I think some people just assume that, you know, if it's fiction, I don't have to do the research, but you do clearly have to do so much research, right? Oh, God, Isn't yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, in the same story, uh, in um, The Secret Corridors, you have a, you refer to the school and you always call it the L, you know, fill in the blanks convent. You never say Loreto. And yeah. uh, it is Loreto, right? I'm just assuming that. <laughs> 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 so why don't you say it? Is that, is that, was that a publisher coming down on you with a legal thing or was it just your comfort? <laughs> what, what caused you to not, because it's sort of obvious, honestly. So why why yeah. was that? Why was it that way? It's such a good question. I think that sometimes, um, and I do it to the extreme in something like Nine Chambered Heart where no one is named and no places are named. And some of, you know, they don't even get that kind of uh, abbreviation okay. at all. Um, but um I think for me, I like that little bit of ambiguity. Mm. I like that little bit of space for, is it? It must be, but is it? <laughs> um, you know, it's made you ask me this question. Yes. So it's obviously sort of stayed with you and struck you. You wouldn't have asked me this if I had written out the full name of the school, whatever it might be. Mm. Um, and so I think, you know, there are ways in which we can leave spaces in different ways for the reader to enter the text and right. I think this is one of them if you um you know if you look at the paintings of um someone like Cezanne for example so a post-impressionist French painter I know why am I bringing him up here I will explain in just a moment um, if you look at a lot of his, you know, later sort of paintings, you will see that he paints a landscape with the barest minimum of strokes. He will paint a mountain, a forest, a tree with the barest minimum of strokes. And what strikes you is the white of the canvas. And I feel like sometimes writing also needs to be a little bit bare. 
that we don't give our readers everything. Um, that we don't sort of fill in the canvas so completely mm. um, that there are no white spaces left for the text to breathe. Mm. I think it's the white spaces that so sharply define the strokes. Um, and I think good writing is a lot like that. To not say, to not reveal, to leave ambiguous so that what is on the page is held up in sharper contrast. Okay, cool, interesting. So um, uh, I have one last question, then we'll open it up for Q&A for everyone else. Um, sure. So if you have questions, folks, you can start putting them in the chat. We're up to 33 people now. So um, the question, I my last question for you was uh, actually sort of related to this, where, um, you know, when we're talking about... Um, uh, it's the story of the El convent. Uh, you have some characters in there that sound very real. Like Sister mm -hmm. Josephine was one that struck out. And mm -hmm. I was wondering, was she entirely your imagination? Or was there some element of reality? Was there someone that you yeah. really knew who inspired Sister Josephine? And that's yeah. important for all kinds of writing, right? Yeah. So yeah. tell us, uh, wh wh where did she come from? I think... I think all of fiction presses up really closely against life. Um, you know, there are no clean, neat boundaries. There are no clean, neat lines. And I don't even know if we require these kinds of divisions. Um, I think that characters always come from, from you, from yourself. Right. No matter who they are even if they are characters who are so unlike you, um, uh, you know, that you, you, you wouldn't identify with them in any way. But just the fact that they are defined in opposition to you connects them to you, right? Um, so they, they, they aren't ever separate from the writer, mm -hmm. I think, at least for me. Uh, my characters come very much from life, but are also a collage of characteristics and, you know, um, physicalities and contexts. Um, you borrow and you steal and you meld and um, you do all of that in service of the story, right? Um, you sometimes bring into sharper focus a certain part of a character, not because they were really like that in real life, but because that serves the purpose of your story uh, to far greater effectiveness. Mm. Right? So absolutely, I would say that everyone uh, in, 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 the, in those stories, in the books after uh, Boats on Land, you know, come from me in some way, from my life, from the, the you know, the, the very immediate world um, around me. Um, they also come from stories about people by other people that I've heard. So really it's it's this, again, this, this you know, kind of complicated network of, um, of people and, and fictional characters. And they oh. all occupy this very messy, um, space sometimes you know the people we re, you know we know and consider real are more fiction than some of our characters <laughs> True you know, years later we will say oh you know that person did this and I can't believe they did this it sounds like you know completely unlike them mm. so who is the person that you've known is it a fiction of themselves mm. right is it a fiction that you have woven about them right so where really do these lines lie, I would ask. <laughs> nice, interesting. So uh, uh, I have the first question. This is from Madhushree. It's a very nice question. It says, I thoroughly enjoyed reading Everything the Light Touches. It came to me at a time when I think I needed to read it. So thank you for existing and writing this book. <laughs> just oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. I uh, just wanted to know a little bit about how the structure came about. Each character through their respective journeys questions certain stereotypes the way we perceive uh, and define different things. Did you have a set of labels or common perceptions you wanted to challenge prior to creating the characters? 
or the other way around what was your approach to the structure okay okay so i'm just going to take that question in two parts um and just um answer the one about um the you know the tackling sort of the stereotypes um, um first um so at the heart of everything the light touches for those of you who may not have seen the book i'll just um hold up a copy because i do actually have one spare copy lying around in the house it's this the new book it's slightly fatter than boats on land i have to admit chetan um <laughs> But at the heart of this book is a hustle between two ways of seeing, okay? One that fixes and categorizes and boxes and labels and a way of seeing that untethers, that frees, that unbinds, that unifies, okay? That is the core of the book, the point at which the stone touches the water, right? and everything else all the themes all the spaces that open up in the book the stereotypes that are tackled the you know the the tussles that happen between certain ways of being and existing and thinking and doing they all stem from that core that core um um you know the the heart of the book which is this this clash between these two ways of seeing right um that's the best way that i can you know explain it for now the structure of the book which for those of you who may not be familiar um is like a flower okay you have a narrative at the center which is the stem and you have uh three narratives around it right that begin in one section so they begin at the front of the book and they end at the very end uh, i don't know if this is making sense but if any of you have read cloud atlas by david mitchell it is exactly that kind of nestled structure so a story within a story within a story within a story and the reason that i did this was because i wanted all of these stories to be entangled in a way that showed us that everything in the world is connected no matter how cliche that may sound i wanted these stories to not feel as though they were lying in their own separate silos their own separate blo narrative blocks but that they bled and wove into each other just like this very beautiful complicated world that we live in yeah i hope that um that mm -hmm. clarifies thank you yeah. now i really want does. to now i really want to read I the book i have a book <laughs> oh my god yes yeah i've read it it's, it's really good thank you it's so amazing much. thank you uh sai has a question she's saying you are so rooted in your culture so your stories emanate from experience uh for some of us who may not be that rooted how does one choose what story to tell i i you know i'm so touched that you say that but in all honesty um i have lived away i have had to live away from shillong for most of my life um principally because of what i was saying earlier because it's such a politically socially turbulent space or has been so turbulent in the past that my generation my friends we've all been mostly pushed out by our parents saying go go make a life elsewhere where it's safer and there are no surprise buns and curfews that sort of erupt and no violence that erupts you know just out of the blue so i've actually spent a lot of my time a lot of my life outside shillong but i think that sometimes that's what creates that kind of tug and that pull mm. back mm. um so it's been a long journey of return not just to place and geography but also story right mm. um the story of the place the stories of the place um how do you pick your stories i would say what is most important to you 
Because if you're not writing about things that are important to you, that you wish to explore, that you wish to share because you've experienced, because you're trying to answer some question that you just can't for the life of you figure out, then, you know, I don't know if that story will uh, mean enough to you for you to finish it, for you to get through draft after draft after draft of a book, right? So it has to be, I think, in some way important to you. It has to come from you and your lived experience, no matter what that might be. Maybe it is about the unrootedness of you, right? Um, and that in itself is rich with so much potential. Yeah. yeah? In, in fact, in some ways, yeah, I, I would say in some ways it actually frees you up because you can write about whatever you want. <laughs> you can always write whatever you want. Yeah. So I'm going to read a couple of the comments and then I'm going to come to the next question. One comment is, uh, it's a your quote, people we know can be more fiction than the characters from the books we read. And uh, Webber says, I like that remark. That's why, because that's why they say truth can be stronger than, fi stranger than fiction. <laughs> um, um, Manish had a comment saying, Jan uh, Janice, your guidance on writing is guidance for life. Thanks so much. Love your metaphors and the take on life. Uh, Ao, Ao Temsu uh, is, is again from the Northeast and he lives in Delhi. So I think I know where this question is coming from. <laughs> but he's saying, living in Delhi, do you find it difficult to write about home? Is there a lot of travel and research that you have to do to work your way around this? Mm. Um, I think we write about home quite differently when we are away from home. Um, and I think that lends a different kind of texture to, um, your, to the stories. Um, but also, I think it's important to try and think about whether those stories require that kind of texture. So Boats on Land, all the stories in Boats on Land, which are so rooted in geography, so anchored to place, were all written in some ways and completed um, a lot of the time away from, from Shillong, right? Um, and I think perhaps that sometimes drives that, that longing that nostalgia even, that, that, that sharpness of detail about a place that only comes to you perhaps when you are far away from it, right? Because you remember that particular smell, that particular view from, you know, that bend in the road, um, that texture of something, you know, the, the pine dust in the air. Um, perhaps if you lived in, in, in the place, those details wouldn't come to you um, in that visceral way. Mm. Um, but for something like Everything the Light Touches, I really uh, owe so much of, um, you know, uh, of being able to complete uh, uh, the narrative that is set there, the first narrative, uh, the shy narrative in the book, because I actually got to spend time in Shillong during the pandemic in a way that I never could before. Um, I think it's happened to quite a few of us that yeah. we've made some kinds of shifts in our lives. And that was one of mine, that I was home and I stayed home much like the character in my book for longer stints. And that shaped the writing in a very particular way because my character was going through the same exact same thing. Mm. Um, so really, I don't think it's ever a disadvantage. I think it just changes the way you tell your stories and sometimes even the kind of stories that you tell. Great, thanks. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna run short on time, but we'll take a couple of questions quickly. Yeah. So Anupam has a important question. Uh, he says, we're told, the publishers are not keen on uh, collections of short stories. So what's your view on writing short stories? Do you write to get published or for the sake of the writing itself? Um, you know, I would say that, that a statement like that was possibly true maybe like 15 years ago um, when I think editors were really looking for the next big Indian novel and felt that, you know, novels were the way to go and um, this is sort of the, the way to kind of make, uh, you know, the big break, make the big money, all of that. 
but I'm I'm not so sure anymore. I sense quite a shift uh, in the industry, um, and it's happened over quite a few years now. It's not anything new. Um, there have been more and more uh, collections of short stories being published, uh, picked up, you know, for um, TV shows, um, things like that. So I'm not sure that still stands uh, true um, entirely right now, but. To respond to, you know, the second half of your question, you know, the world around us is, is extremely fickle. One day it's short stories, the next day it's novels, and then, oh, it's not even reading anymore, it's something else. Um, you know, so how do we keep up with things like that? I don't think we can, and I don't know if it's worth even wasting our energy and time trying to. What we need to stay true to is what we want to do, what gives meaning to us. And if that's writing, then you write what you wish to. You're, you write to be true to the story. And, you know, if you love what you're doing, if you get better and better at it, um, if you are enjoying it, if it makes you laugh and entertains you, you will find your audience, you know, regardless of whether it's short stories or novellas or epic poems or novels or, you know, whatever else, you know, the next big publishing thing might be. Yeah. Great. We'll take uh, one more question, uh, then we'll have to switch to the discussion about the words. Uh, Aloka yeah. has a question saying, everything the light touches still gives me goosebumps, but nine chambered heart was my heart. How did you manage to see this character from so many different perspectives? It felt mm -hmm. like very deep uh, character work or study. Thank you. And, you know, I'm so glad you enjoyed Nine Chambered Heart. It was a bit of an experimental novella. So I'm really glad um, that it worked for you. For those of you who may not know uh, about Nine Chambered Heart, it's a really simple premise. It's, um, it's the story of one character, one woman, one young woman, through the voices of nine people around her. And the way that they are connected to her is that either they have loved her or she has loved them. So it's a biography of a character told through love, right? And so um, I suppose in some ways that also answers your question. You know, we are different with different people. We are different with different people who love us differently. And so we show ourselves in different ways to um you know, um, uh, the people that we encounter and have in our lives in these particular ways. Um, and so each of these narrators, these voices, see different parts of her, especially because, of course, she's growing up, she's having these different experiences, um, and they encounter her at different points in her life, and she is somewhat the same, but also different, because that's how we are, we shift and we change and we are not the same people that we were yesterday sometimes, right? Um, and so that's what I was trying to capture, the really shape-shifting quality of identity. Um, and shape-shifting in a way that sometimes even we ourselves can't quite fathom, you know, or understand. Um, so yeah, so that's what I was trying to do with with Nine Chambered Heart. And I'm really glad you enjoyed it. <laughs> now I have to really read that book. So uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Manish, I saw that there was a question from you, but I'm sorry, I'm going to have to jump on now. I've come to the heartburn section. So I stepped into the balcony so you guys can see the view behind me. And it's after that, we'll talk about, <laughs> after that, we'll talk about uh, the word uh, count. So Janice, just to give you an idea, uh, what the first draft club is that all these yeah. folks who are here and a few others are all trying to write their first drafts and they all yeah. commit to some target, some number. So they want to try and get some of the writing done. It's mostly around the first draft kind of a framework. Uh, and okay. right now uh, in, in 12 days, uh, you've written or uh, they've collectively written 185,000 words. Oh my God. That's so, amazing. Yeah. And that's less than 50, 60 people. It's about 58 people. So that's a lot of progress. So I think it's awesome how well you all, you've all done 
and uh, keep going. But if there's any discussions that you wanted to have, we started the word prompts yesterday. So um, if you wanted to talk about the word prompts or the writing prompts or anything else, um, we can chat about all that stuff now. So any thoughts, any questions, any comments or suggestions, we're always interested. I was freezing outside, I've come back inside. <laughs> it's really cold here. <laughs> Folks, anything that you'd like to share or comment on or talk about? I think for tomorrow we have, uh, is Krishna Kumar here? Tomorrow he's nominated. Um, I'm just pulling it up. You know, Manish has a really good question. If at some point we have just a small... Uh, we don't... Yeah, you can you can take it right now if you want because I'm not... Um, we don't have any just, comments for this. So go okay, ahead. Okay, right. So just to, just to go back to Manish's question, he asks, when we tell stories from our experience, how do we choose between a memoir and fiction? How do we balance between being true to what happened and what could have happened? Is there any struggle when you expand experience of a character whom you know somewhere personally? So I'm just going to take that in two parts. I'll be very quick so I don't take up you know, too sure. much of no time. Problem. But Manish, uh, it's a great question. And I would just suggest and urge you to go back to the beginning of our discussion, which is what is your intention for the story? What do you want the story to do? Because the impulse right, the motivational impulse for a memoir and for a novel are very, very different in some ways, right? Um, a memoir is very much about uh, a laying out of um, your life, but also, of course, narrativized in a certain way to make sense of it for yourself and for your readers, right? Um, uh, whereas with fiction, um, you are trying to explore that moment when the stone drops into the pond, right? So it really depends on which motivational impulse you wish to follow and also be what you wish to, for your story to do, yeah? Um, it, it, it really, really comes down, you know, to to that because with a memoir there will be of course certain ways to make sense of your life and to give it thematic cohesion but with a novel um, there is let's just say more space for you to uh, shape sculpt I won't say manipulate I'll say sculpt um, you know um, uh, in a way that then serves the heart of your story, right? There is much more space to do that, uh, I would imagine, than writing a memoir. I've never written a memoir, but I would imagine that it, it's constrictive only in that way, that you can't really change events entirely. Or, or maybe you could, but that would definitely make the memoir sort of dabble in the realm of fiction, which I'm not sure we want, you know, we want it to do. Um, um, and how do we balance being true to what happened and what could have happened? Depends what you're writing. For a memoir, I would imagine it is important to be, you know, truthful. Uh, whichever way you choose to, to, to place that truth and to narrativize that truth. But with fiction, you can play God, right? You can really do what you wish to do or what you feel your characters need to do to serve the story. Yeah. Um, and your last question, very, very important when you also place characters from life, characters from your own life in your fiction, right, in your writing. And, um, you know, what then? What if they read your book? Will they be offended? Will they be thrilled? We don't know. But I'm going to just steal an answer from uh, a writer named uh, Sebastian um, uh, Sebastian Folk, um, who wrote Bird Song, and he said um, in in an essay that he wrote that to be an artist, to be a writer, to create art, one must have a certain streak 
of ruthlessness. That if it solves your story, that's what gains priority, right? Um, so if this person whom you know, who perhaps shares some space in your life, um, is in the space of this story, and it works to 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 you know to be truthful about how they are. He says, "Do it, because that is you being honest um, to your story." Um, I don't know how many friends he has, but, <laughs> <laughs> but that was his advice. Um, to me, which I've often found quite useful when I'm grappling with something like that. So anyway, thank you for your question, Manish, and I will leave you to the rest of, you know, uh, to the rest of your workshop. Sure. So Manish, you're also giving us the writing prompt for tomorrow. But thank you for taking that question. And I'm, 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 I'm glad that you did. And that was insightful, because the whole memoir fiction thing comes up all the time. And mm -hmm. uh, we were, in fact, talking about it today. I'm in the middle of a workshop. So um, great. Well, it's it's six o'clock. Thank you so much. It's uh, been an absolute delight having you here. And I think that's universal. It, I'm already seeing a lot of comments and and um, we also have a WhatsApp group separately. So we get a lot oh, of uh, information from there. So uh, yeah, it's been brilliant. And um, everybody, I'm so, uh, I'm so happy to see the progress that you're making. So, um, you know, 185,000 words in, by day 12 is just insane. It's amazing. Um, yeah. So uh, keep it yeah. keep it going and all the best. And uh, thank you again, Janice. And thanks everyone for joining. Not at all. Thank you. Such a delight and good luck with all of your drafts. Yeah. Take care. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you.